not. Uh, the reason I'm asking the brother and sister in the back to get close because I'm showing some slides and the screen is too small. And I really want not to lose you. So if you can come closer, I would really appreciate it. And uh, there are some interesting uh, charts and data that, that is revealing uh, on uh, the reasons of the prohibition of ribbon. The, uh, the, uh, you, you will find that uh, most of the work that was done on riba in the 20th century focused on contracts, how to make sure that the contract is devised in a proper way, which is fine and well, but was never focused on the most significant ruling that is unique to Islam, which has to do with what I call in the book the uh, commodity indexation concept and the market to the market concept. And the commodity indexation concept is based on a very well known hadith uh, to all Muslims, and that is a dhahabu bi dhahab, which is gold for gold, silver for silver, barley for barley, wheat for wheat, salt for salt, dates for dates, spot transactions only. And uh, it took me a long time to reflect on this hadith, and I concluded that it forms the foundation of a monetary system that Muslims should abide by. Now, that is said, uh, you can use uh, paper money uh, to your heart's desire. You can use uh, dollars, Canadian dollars, you can use yuans, euros, as long as <coughs> you mark the item that you're buying to the market, and as long as you relate it to one of the staple commodities in the community you live in. At the time of the Prophet ﷺ, uh, the commodities that were staple commodities were the gold and silver, which used to be called al tathmin al muthaminat the things which used for pricing, and the four food items were uh, shair barley and wheat uh, and salt and dates. Now, uh, in a country like Saudi Arabia, a staple product in Saudi Arabia would be uh, oil and natural gas, and maybe wheat because they produce wheat. In a country like uh, Pakistan, when Pakistan used to produce a lot of uh, cotton and, and rice, and think before what happened has happened, then these are the staples, and so on and so forth. So, what we did, <coughs> we wanted to, to do two things. Uh, and I'm going to show you the slides, but conceptually, we live in America in a Judeo-Christian country, or North America, and uh, we use uh, things loosely in, with good intentions, but I think without paying attention to the sensitivities of others. For instance, uh, when I came into this business, it used to be called interest-free banking. And uh, we soon changed that, alhamdulillah, it caught on riba free banking. And uh, they added riba free Islamic banking. And what we'd like to do, we'd like to take that label Islamic because it's very exclusive. As a matter of fact, I uh, wrote a paper which I will present at Harvard. Uh, and uh, the reviewer uh, was a little bit confused. Uh, she said that, uh, I thought that you're only doing this for Muslims, not for all people of all faith. The idea is, imagine Citibank or TD Waterhouse or uh, Bank of Montreal goes to Pakistan or India or Egypt or Saudi Arabia and they call themselves the Christian Bank of America. Right there, they have cut themselves out of the market. So we need to be intelligent in our pursuit of the goal that we want to achieve, and that is Judeo-Christian Islamic North America. A Judeo-Christian Islamic North America with Islamic finance, or I like to call it now, RIBA or RIBIT free financing, RF banking and finance, offered to all people of all faith. And when you become the custodian of people's savings and assets, when you become the trusted person 
to manage people's assets and to advise them financially, believe me, that means you have arrived as the newcomers to this wonderful land. Um, we have done a study of the prohibition of riba in the Abrahamic faith. As a matter of fact, riba has been prohibited by all faith. Uh, Hinduism, uh, even Plato prohibited riba in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. If you read the Old Testament, uh, the word for riba is ribit, R-I-B-I-T, which has the same meaning as riba. And uh, interestingly enough, if a Jew, person of the Jewish faith, participates in any riba or ribit transaction, he or she cannot stand as a witness in a Jewish court until today. And until today, in all synagogues around the world, there is ribbit free lending societies doing Qard Hassan, our concept of Qard. And the people of the Jewish faith had a problem in Europe, and as in, uh, commerce grew, they wanted to finance it ribbit free They came up with a mechanism which is similar to the Musharaka mechanism, which is the joint venture mechanism, and they call it heter iska. And the details are of all of this are in, in the book. In the Catholic faith, it's a very interesting thing. I remember when I was younger, and we used to read Maulana Yusuf Ali a translation of the Holy Quran, he translated riba as usual, and everybody criticized the man. The man was dead, he couldn't defend himself, until I read the original Catholic versions of the prohibition of usury. And the definition of usury is an amazing light that actually focused us, focused me personally, on understanding the real meaning of riba. And uh, they define usury as the price you pay for the use of money. That's where the usury word came from. The price you pay for the use of money, otherwise called interest. And uh, this uh, development, development of the word interest came in the Catholic Church, has its history, but I don't want to bore you with the details. So, usury is the renting of money. So, the most simple definition of riba is the act of renting money at a price called interest rate, and that is usury. And it is prohibited in Catholicism. As a matter of fact, in the early days of Catholicism, any Catholic who participated in riba or ribbit would be denied Catholic burial, <coughs> and he would not be forgiven by their priests. Amazingly, of course, things have changed quite a bit uh, afterwards. The other thing I want to shed some light on is the development of world history. In the time of Prophet uh, Joseph, as you remember, Prophet Joseph and Prophet Moses uh, had a relationship with my country of birth, Egypt, in a fascinating way. They came to it in the same general circumstances, uh, you know, rescued by either the pharaoh of Egypt or the king of Egypt. The pharaoh of Egypt actually took Joseph and Joseph became, so to speak, the chairman of the Federal Reserve of Egypt, uh, like Mr. Alan Greenspan, right? Uh, he said, Ijalni al Khazan al Ard. That's exactly what, what Joseph was. And, and, and uh, the Hebrews that came with him, actually, became the very affluent, very efficient, but then things started deteriorating when they started trading in money. And when they started trading in money, over the years, their situation changed from being the owners of assets into the slaves of Egypt during Moses' time. And Moses was sent to free the Hebrews to cross the Red Sea into the Sinai. That era we call the era of slavery. And when Moses came in the Old Testament in chapter called Exodus, uh, verses 22 to 26, it clearly and definitively prohibits the charging of interest on the rent. 
and if you read the laws of the charging of interest, you will find that it is so detailed such that you cannot use any hila or rules against these rules. For instance, you cannot lend a person money and then get to be paid back by living in his home for free, or you cannot lend them money. You'll find that for the first time in the history of the world, Islam came to canonize, to make a law that has been very specific to the lending to the poor, and that law says there is nothing called loan except one type of loan, and that's Qard al Hasan. So we close that chapter. Not only that, but that Qard al Hasan you cannot increase, regardless of the number of years, regardless of what happens, and it is better to forgive it. And that's why it's called Qard. The amazing thing is, when you read the Old Testament, and the New Testament, <coughs> and the Quran, the word Qard means to bite. It's a bite of your essence. The same exact meaning is used in the Old Testament. It's called Neshek or Neshek, which means Qard. Because what you are doing, you are taking a bite out of your assets to give it to the poor and the needy. And there is a whole set of rules and regulations that's mentioned in the book, actually, that talks about the rules that were for the first time put in the form of a law by the Islamic law. And by the way, I use the word law in the book, and uh, I defined it as the Judeo-Christian Islamic set of rules and regulations as actually perfected uh, by the revelation of Islam and based on the teachings of Ibrahim and all the subsequent prophets including Prophet Moses and Prophet Isa and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then we come to the next stage. Let me then go to the slides. Any questions so far? Is this clear? The real tricky part that came with Islam is how to handle commercial transactions. Because now people needed money not because they are poor. Ansar needs money not because they are poor. They need money so they can expand, right? Their capital needs. A McDonald's, which has all of these thousands of stores, uh, doesn't need money because they are poor. They need money because they need to finance their operations and grow. So the question is how to regulate this to make it abide by the Sharia. And I think this is the major contribution that Islam brought to the civilization of mankind. And, and I wish that we can present it this way, not as a way to, 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 to uh, demonize other systems or to belittle others, but as a way to build on what others have built in a continuum that inshallah will make a wonderful future for all of us. It asked me to share with you this. La Riba started in 1987 and uh, yours truly uh, used to go out actually when I was younger like uh, we learned from Sheikh Abdullah Idris going out and raising funds for Islamic centers and schools all over the world all over. and every time I come back home tired and I tell myself there must be a better way of doing this. There must be a better way of accumulating the savings of the community and then deploying it in developing the community needs. And uh, in 1987, we started Larimut. I went to the rich and affluent in the community. They laughed at me. They said, yeah, yeah, get out of it. If you need a donation, we'll give it to you, but get me out of it. I don't want to get in the community. And they will tell me that you're taking our money. I said, thank you very much. Went to people who are our friends from the middle class, and I said, if you have a $10,000, and if I lose it, you will not hate me for the rest of your life, let us put it together. And we raised $200,000, alhamdulillah, in 87. By the grace of Allah, today, we have over $400 million in assets that we service, and not only that, we own a full-service bank in the United States of America, it's a national banking association. And through this bank, we have financed at least six Islamic centers, seven Islamic schools around the country, 
ranging between $1.85 million to $500,000. We finance the headquarters of ICNA in New Jersey, in addition to many doctors, in addition to many cars, in addition to many homes, in addition to providing the, the opposite mirror of these investments, and that is the certificates of deposit for people who want to, finance, to invest according to the Islamic Sharia and have an income which is halal income by the grace of Allah. We have a total of 50 employees and uh, they come from all over the world. And we have them from different faiths also. Uh, we have, uh, for, uh, for your, we have, uh, I haven't had Somalia yet, but inshallah soon we'll get from Somalia. But we have uh, Egypt, Sudan, Ethiopia. We have Indonesia, Vietnam, Pakistan, India, uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Madagascar, France, Cambodia, uh, Palestine, Jordan, you will have them all by the grace of Allah. And it's a fantastic experience. Uh, the way we uh, bring our, uh, our candidates, uh, we uh, hire them as non-bankers and we teach them banking the way it should be. They are riba free banking. And I, in, the, in the book I talk in great details how we recruit them, how we interview them in great details, how we prepare them, how we train them, and so on and so forth. And also how we took a bank and restructured it to become a riba free or ribbit free bank. By the way, in the bank, and that's the biggest revelation Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to me, 95% of our depositors are non-Muslim. 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 Alhamdulillah. <laughs> You go and tell the brothers and sisters, you know, we have the bank. By the way, we have the most sophisticated, the most sophisticated internet banking facility that a bank would have. You can do internet banking like a charm. I am a computer, I'm an old man, but I love computers, I love things and stuff like that. So we have the most sophisticated system by the grace of Allah, but haven't come yet. And I think, I think, to reason it to myself, I think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants it this way so we can use this as a window on how to do mu'amalat, how to deal. And Allah is my witness. We have people, all the seven churches in town are our customers. The synagogue in town is coming to become our customer. And they refer us to others. They say we have never seen bankers like this. And, and that's the quality of a Muslim that we want to bring out, that people trust. Because a dinu al muamala, religion, faith, <coughs> is not uh, having a sign here because of your prayers or how big a beard, which are very important, alhamdulillah. But it is how you deal, how you interact with people, and that's what makes it difference. Now we get to, is that not service our portfolios? Because if a brother or a sister, and I'm not doing this to advertise, because we do not operate in Canada, so please, rest assured, I'm not trying to tout an advertising horn. But uh, what we, we, we do, we serve the customer until the end of the financing term. <coughs> and we practice tarahum, which is mercifulness, which means if a brother or a sister lose their jobs, we don't jump in and foreclose on their homes. We have a special fund which helps them until they find a job. Alhamdulillah. So the barakah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala covers us in a nice way and we can't uh, do anything but say, and tell people about the ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on us, insha'Allah. Uh, uh, that uh, I said, uh, the introduction, so I can go a little fast. Now I want to give you a little bit of history. Uh, after World War II, uh, the two major powers, and these were the United Kingdom and the United States of America, in addition to many, many other countries, mostly European, came together to a New Hampshire uh, city called the Britain Woods, and they had the Britain Woods Agreement. In the Britain Woods Agreement, they all agreed to treat dollar like gold, and that's also detailed in the book. And they said that every ounce of gold would be worth $35. You bring me an ounce of gold, I'll give you $35. You bring me $35, I'll give you an ounce of gold. And they started the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank and the World Trade Agreement. 
But then the United States started printing a lot of dollars. Now, the dollars printed is called fiat money. This money here, this is Canadian dollars. This is fiat money. It's money by decree of the government, all right? In other words, this is uh, the cost about probably five cents, six cents to print, but we say it's $20. So it's $20, no problem. But the most important thing is how do you relate it to a basic commodity? In this case, I'm talking about the gold. It was $35 an ounce. Now, the United States printed a lot of dollars to redevelop Germany and Europe and redevelop Japan, and the Europeans ended up flooded with dollars. And that dollar is used to be called Euro dollars. Charles de Gaulle, for those of you in my age group know who is Charles de Gaulle, used to be a hero of the Second World War, and in the same time, <coughs> was the president of France. He said, I've got all of these dollars, and I can send them to America and get gold for it. He started sending dollars to America and get gold. He took one-third of the gold in Fort Knox. As a matter of fact, the story goes that gold used to go to London, and the London Metal Exchange uh, building. The second floor collapsed because of the weight of the gold. Then Nixon administration and Nixon just woke up and said what's going on this man is going to take all of our gold out so in August 1971 Nixon announced the closing of the gold window it means we cannot give you gold at $35 an ounce anymore it will be given to you at the market price and that gold that was selling for $35 an ounce then is the same gold that is selling today at $1,100 an ounce. So what happened? The gold is a gold, but the dollar value has declined. If you had a dollar then, it is worth two dollar, uh, two 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 and a half cents approximately today. All right? Is this clear? Yeah. That's the first historic fact. 1972, an ounce of gold was $64 an ounce. Today, it's about $1,100 to $1,200 an ounce. Not much different than the gasoline in America. I bought gasoline in 1972 for 20 cents. In 2009 and 2010, it was $3.20. Essentially, the same ratio. The second thing that happened in America was interest rate. Interest rate in the United States actually was kept very low. But then something happened, and that was the change in oil prices in 1973. People say it's because they claim it is because of the embargo. It was not because of the embargo. It was actually because of the supply and demand. The price of oil was too low, could not justify for drilling for oil anymore. Then Supply was limited, demand kept going up, and that created the oil problem, and then inflation, and to combat inflation, they raised interest rate big time, and those of you in my age group, they remember what happened in the late 70s, early 80s, when interest rates went to 19% in the United States. Then, oh, sorry, I have, uh, I think I have one. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me. Get me briefcase under you. There. This man went on what we call the bubble economy. Now, the bubble economy started by blowing up the first asset that's available, and that was the stock market. And the second asset was the housing market, and the rest of the story is history. Do I need to elaborate, or you know? You know, right? Okay. Wow. This thing goes really fast. Allahi, it would be nice. <laughs> Here we go. I'll go easy. All right. So these are the different ages that we talk about in Moses, the age of slavery, in the time of Jesus, then 
the age of agrarian societies and feudalism. And again, Jesus came to expand and deepen the teachings of Moses. And then commercial age, when Prophet Muhammad came to expand on Moses and Jesus and develop a new set of rules and codes in financing businesses. And then today we live in what I call the paper money age or the financial age. And this is what needs, in my humble opinion, a Judeo-Christian Islamic challenge and opportunity. And I think this represents an historic opportunity and, uh, and, and what we need to do, we need to focus on the spirit and substance of riba free banking. Unfortunately, the word Islamic banking has been loosely used and unfortunately, uh, and I, in the book actually I describe a personal experience where we brought in a very high level Sharia scholar and we told him we want you to look at our contracts and I have it all documented. And I did it intentionally because I wanted it for the history for my children and grandchildren. That we cannot live with Hila anymore. We have come where we are today because of these facades. Everything is fine. My family is first class. You open the door. The wife is not happy with her husband. The husband is not happy with his wife and their children. And it is a farce. We need to change that, we need to be factual, we need to read, we need to decide for ourselves. And you can read that in the book, inshallah. And I described to you the meaning of a usury. Just the amazing thing is a very uh, well-known Catholic scholar by the name of Saint Aquinas. Saint Aquinas actually in his writings he said, that money is like an apple or like grapes. You cannot rent an apple. Can we rent an apple? Can I go to Parvez and see my say Parvez or Jalan? Can I rent this apple from you?